I uh, was happily in college pursuing the sciences, okay? I wanted to do the life sciences. And um, then one day the Lord spoke and he says, Ken, I want you to study law. And I said, first I said, you've got to be kidding. Okay, that probably wasn't the right thing to say to God, but that was the first thing that popped into my mind. You've got to be kidding. And uh, after that, um, I decided, well, if I'm going to go to law school, I better learn to write better. You know, being in the life sciences, you're doing experiments, right? So you don't get a whole lot of practice with your composition skills. So I thought, what should I study in order that I may be really ready for law? And I tried to think of which majors would cause me to have to do a lot of writing. So I came upon history, history major, lots of papers, right? Every class. Anyway, <clears throat> it turned out to be a lot of fun. I had some of the most quirky professors in all of university life with my history professors. Um, and and it just wasn't just their quirkiness. They, they taught me some things that really left some life lessons. Uh, one teacher especially impressed me. He says, you know, when I assign books to you guys to read, I'm choosing only the best. These are the ones that are recognized by all the other experts. So you can not only get the best information, but you can think like a really good thinker. Okay? And so I've copied that as a pattern of my life to, to do uh, the things that I do. Another one, in order to encourage us, he says, you know what? You guys got to realize you are already historians. I go, I am? Here I am just sitting in class, you know. And he was talking to all of us who were in the history major and saying we were all historians. And, and I think he must have done that to make us feel good and to motivate us. And so I left there always thinking, I'm a historian. After all, I've got a degree in history. And yet, over the years, I've looked back and I've decided my professor was wrong. And this is what I mean by saying he was wrong. Not to say he's bad, I just disagree. Uh, studying history makes me a student of history. It does not make me a historian. When I have written a historical work, even if it's just the chronology of my family's life history, then I could maybe call myself a historian, right? And so the difference is this. It isn't just the studying, but it is in the doing. And I think we as Christians often make the same mistake, that we think by knowing that we are there, that we are accomplished, we are finished. Um, here's an analogy maybe many of you can relate to. There's a big difference between a fan and a player, right? So what we're trying to say is we want people to get into the action, to get into the life, to get into the role and become a player. Becoming a player is what our series coming up is going to be about. Um, I had said last week that we're going to start a new series. We're going to take a little break from Mark. We'll come back to it and we'll finish it. But uh, we're going to be preaching um, in a little different fashion so that as you are inviting people, as they're starting the new school semester, as uh, you start to reach out to friends, remember our theme this year, right? Deeper, further. We've been working on the deeper. We now need to get into the further and the bolder. Time to start reaching out, to start inviting. And so we're going to try to make these messages a lot easier, don't need too much background for it, kind of more self-contained. Okay, uh, so anyway, the uh, title of this morning's message is The Jesus Way, The Jesus Life. 
And it's about making us more than just fans. It's about turning us into players. Turn with me to John chapter 13. And we read from that passage earlier. And Jesus said, I have done this and I want it to be an example for you. Um, what has happened is pretty surprising, perhaps even shocking. Peter thought it was shocking. He told Jesus to cut it out, to quit doing what he was doing. So Peter was pretty bold about it. And what was happening was they are coming together for one last fellowship. And they have rented a room called the upper room. And here Jesus launches into his last night before his death. And what he's going to do is he's going to teach them some really important things. He talks about how he is a vine and they are the branches. And that if they ask anything in his name, it will be done. And he reassures them, but he also reveals to them who's going to betray or that he's going to be betrayed, uh, things like that. But before he started with the first word out of his mouth, he surprised everybody. He took the basin and he took the towel that was provided and he started to wash each of the disciples' feet. And that's when Peter said, hey, Lord, no, no, you shouldn't be doing this. It's improper, okay? Um, well, <clears throat> Jesus went ahead and did it. He says, I have to do it. This is very important for me to do it. And uh, so if you read this, you see that uh, he expresses that as a master, he is teaching them something. He is serving them and he wants them to serve one another. He wants them to show the kind of love, the kind of humility that he's been showing. Now, this is something that they've heard, but not something they had been doing. Up to now, they were still fighting about who's going to be top dog, right? Who's going to be the one to sit on Jesus' left and Jesus' right? They were still concerned about status. And so if you're concerned about status, you don't want to be the person who's washing somebody else's feet. And Jesus sees this. And so he gives them this message that he enacts. And in a sense, the message he gives here is what we call a meta message, M-E-T. It's a larger message. Remember last week, the title of the sermon was Meta, okay? Uh, this is the higher message. This is the deeper message. This is the more important message. And the message is this. If you like Jesus, then be like Jesus. That's what he was saying to his apostles. If you like me, be like me. You think they're going to get it? He's telling them that he doesn't want mere followers, I mean mere admirers. He wants followers. He wanted people to be like him. It's not enough to know all the things that he's taught them until they start to live like him, behave like him, it doesn't help. It doesn't make a difference. In fact, I can tell you from my Christian experience, some of the people I've known who have known the Bible so well, but whose lives were not full of the love and the humility that Jesus had, they were the worst examples of Christians. They were not the kind of people you want to expose the non-believer to because they came off as mean, they came off as judgmental, they came off as superior, and that's why so many non-believers don't like Christians. And so it's important to know the doctrine, but the challenge is be those who can do 
to grow from being a fan to being a player, not just a history student, but a historian. And so at this late stage in the game, Jesus is still challenging his apostles to grow, to grow like him in humility, in love, to practice it with one another. Because if you can't even practice it with your own group, how can you practice it beyond the group? And that's why in fellowship, I push so hard. That's why in Sunday school, I push so hard for the young people to learn to be in community, to learn to love and appreciate to not show disrespect to one another. Because if they can't learn it internally in the group that's most comfortable for them, that accepts them, how are they going to do it beyond? And so Jesus did the same thing. He says, try to learn it with one another. If you like me, be like me. Don't be an admirer, but be a follower. And he says, I've left this as an example. And I don't think he walked in planning this example. But as he walked in, and the natural thing is, that's the first thing you do when you walk in off the street, when you come into a house, right? We Chinese, first thing you do is to take off your shoes. For the Jews, first thing you do is wash one another's feet. Actually, you have the servants did it, do it, but they didn't have any servants there. But it still needed to be done. And so Jesus took the initiative, and he did it. And if they could learn this, they would be good representatives of the kingdom. Now, Jesus long ago has said, take my yoke. I am meek and lowly of heart. Learn of me. You see? And he says, if you learn of me, then you'll find how easy my yoke is and you will be blessed. Same thing in this passage. If you are a doer, you will be blessed. Don't just be an admirer, be a follower. And then later on, they heard the flip side because in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, this is what Jesus said to some of those others. 646, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? You see? So he's really insisting on it. Well, later on, as the Christians came along in Philippians 2.5, you have Paul who says, let this mind, let these attitudes and values be in you as they were in Christ. Okay? 1 Peter 2.21, he says, follow in his steps. But I'm just going to ask you to look at one verse that kind of summarizes his real nicely, way at the end, 1 John 2.6. So turn with me to 1 John 2.6. And actually, we'll start at verse 5. At the end of verse 5, it says this, By this we may know, be sure, that we are in him. Verse 6, Whoever says he abides in him, ought to do what? Walk in the same way in which he walked. Okay? And so this is the message that goes throughout this New Testament and why I call it the meta message. Now, I'm teaching a parenting program. You guys know that. Now, that parenting program, in the last session, you're supposed to hand out an evaluation form. And the third question on the evaluation form is this. Does the presenter model what he's teaching? How about that? When was the last time you saw that on the evaluation form? Not does the presenter just know his stuff. Not just is the presenter a good communicator. But does he model the thing that we're calling you to do. Um, Almost felt like eliminating that question. Anyway, it's a challenge. It's the hardest part, but it's the most important to move our growth from the head to the heart to our hands, to move it all the way down to where it counts, where the action takes place. 
Well, Jesus knew that this was important, this kind of growth. And that's why he pushed for them to follow, and he lived a life to show it. Now, in the 21st century, after 30 years of research, professor at Stanford University, who had also been a, a professor at um, Yale and Columbia, came out with a book called Mindset, okay? And it's talking about our mindset and our attitudes. And the reviews go like this. Every teacher, every parent, every manager needs to read this book. What it is is she discovered that there's two mindsets that are very different from one another. On the one hand, you've got the mindsetter that she calls the fixed mindset. The fixed mindset is the one who looks at his talents, looks at his abilities, and says, wow, or maybe not so wow. <laughs> but he looks at it, and he thinks that that's it. What I've got, I've got. And the problem with having that mindset is then you start to focus and fixate on it, and you start to compare against other people and see, am I smarter than them? Am I more talented than them? And then at work and in life, you fight to keep the position, your status. If you're number four, you want to not let anybody replace you as number four. And so you tend to become very conservative. And so you don't tend to grow. You tend to rest on what you think are your God-given attributes. The other mindset is what's called the growth mindset. Okay? And they did this experiment with 10th grade, 10-year-olds. Uh, um, not just 10-year-olds, they did it with adults, but they, they found how early it sets in. And what they found was these 10-year-olds, they, they put them into a situation where they were testing them and they gave them mathematical things to, um, to challenge them. And they told them it would get progressively harder. And they noticed that the kids who had the fixed mindset, when they got to one that they couldn't accomplish, couldn't overcome, they gave up. Oh, this test is stupid. I should have never volunteered, okay? The kids on this side, with a growth mindset, they go, oh boy, here's a challenge that I can struggle with and I can try to overcome. They were not afraid. Even when they got to their failure, they just saw this as a springboard, an opportunity to mark where they are and then to try to push past it. Totally, entirely different mindsets. One leads to growth. The other one leads to preserving, guarding, and comparing. Let me give you a quote from this world-famous professor. People who believe in the power of talent tend not to fulfill their potential because they're so concerned with looking smart and not making mistakes. And so they found that when they tried to give something challenging to these people, they says, no, give it to the other guy. Because what happens? If you fail, you're afraid you're going to get demoted. You're not going to be as highly thought of. And uh, this professor goes on, and she identifies that this was one of the reasons why Enron failed. They gathered up all the smartest people they could find. That was their mantra. We have the smartest people. And then these people got into a preservation mode. And when they ran into problems, instead of thinking creatively and get past their problems, they went into guarding and safety and eventually cheating to keep up the appearance of success. And finally, the bankruptcy, which brought down so many people in America, people who were investors and weren't even a part of that. And so Jesus wanted his followers 
to not just followers in their mind, not just be admirers, not just be students of, but to learn how to do, because it's in the doing that you get the breakthrough, right? How many of you have tried to learn a new skill? And when they explained it, it sounded right, it sounded okay. Then when you had to do it, what happened? Maybe by step number two, or even step number one, you found out you didn't understand it. I mean, I've stopped for directions. And they give you the directions, and it sounds so easy, right? Second turn, I'm already lost again. You've got to get to that point of doing it before you can experience those breakthroughs. Fundamental. Now, Jesus not only taught at that time, but I think, you know, when, when you think about the people he chose, he chose mostly, probably 11 out of 12 were blue-collar types, not likely to be educated, not from high-status backgrounds. And, and sometimes I wonder if he chose that to show how if they would follow him, how far they could go beyond anybody would have ever imagined. That how following his way and with the help of the Holy Spirit, they could have breakthrough after breakthrough and they can break out of their past and move so far beyond their beginnings. Another illustration immigrants that come to America, do they face challenges? Do they have ceilings that they got to break past? They do. And do they look at those things and give up? No. They strive to break through those things. And next thing you know, you know, they're doing great. See? So it's kind of fundamental in the law of life. And so Jesus, actually, he lived his whole life showing us that it's not how you start, it's how you end up. That despite being a man of sorrows, despite being a man whose career starts off saying, I don't even have a place to lay my head, he showed that you could live a life of great peace and joy, you could live a life of great community and love, you could have a life of great purpose and fulfill that purpose. So that at the end, he says that all that the Father gave to me, I have done and it is finished. And all those that you gave to me, I didn't lose a single one. I don't know about you, but I'm always losing stuff at home. Yesterday, I discovered I had lost track of both my wallet and my cell phone. Which one would you rather lose track of? I know for some of you, you'd rather keep hold of your phone. Others of you, you'd rather keep a hold of your wallet. Well, I'm always losing things, okay? And forgetting um, just part of that stage of life. Jesus could say, all that you gave me to do, I have accomplished. I didn't drop a single ball. So uh, Jesus shows a way, and he offers it to us. In John 10.10, 10, he says, listen, I have lived the abundant life, and I've come to give you life. This is where I'm starting to quote from John 10, 10. And what kind of a life is it going to be? An abundant life. This is a grade life, an abundant life. And then in John 14, 6, what did he say? He says, follow me. And here's the quote, for I am the way. I am the truth. Thank you. <laughs> I am the light. Okay? And so... And I'm taking that and I'm reversing it. Jesus is the life and he shows us the way. And we need to follow and have a great life. And some of you are thinking, oh, Pastor Ken, but that's not fair. He was God. Anybody think of that? That's all right. You don't have to admit it. When Jesus lived on earth, it says that he decided to take all of his divine powers and put them on hold. He was not going to do anything using his divine abilities. Okay? Like when a president, a candidate becomes president, what do we do? We make him put all his property and trust, right, into a receivership so that he doesn't have any interference there. Well, 
Jesus put all his divine attributes on hold, his powers, because he wanted to show that it could be something that anybody could achieve. Now, this is maybe a little tricky for you guys to get a hold of because most of us, it's hard for us to think of him as just a human, okay, in the sense of how he lived his life. Um, you guys remember the uh, Christmas carol, Away in the Manger? You remember that line where it says, no crying he makes? My little granddaughter, sweet as she is, she cries. Have you ever known a baby that never cried? Babies cry. I think Jesus cried when he was an infant. How else are you going to let mom know that you're hungry, right? Or that you just pooped when you're an infant. You're going to cry. So sometimes we get this really weird idea about Jesus growing up as a person. Teenagers, do you think Jesus had acne and, God forbid, even pimples? Very, very possible, right? I mean, you think suddenly one day he was so good at carpentry that people looked at him and said, the carpenter of Nazareth. How did he learn carpentry? The same way Uncle Michael learned guitar. One strand at a time. One note at a time. And so he had to be apprenticed by his father. Jesus didn't just suddenly walk into the shop one day and says, okay, Dad, move over. I'm ready to take over the business. He had to go in there and spend all that time learning and growing and messing up. I think some of his first original projects may not have come in as perfect projects. We were in wood shop, and my friend Gary was, we were working on a broom holder. That was always the first project in wood shop. You made this broom holder that had a little notch, and you can hang your broom upside down on the wall. I don't know why you want to hang a broom like that, but that was the first project. And Gary, he was such a perfectionist. He was going to make the very best broom holder. And so he planed it to get it smooth and get it to be at the right angle. And he was never satisfied. You know what? By the time he realized it, he only had enough wood for a miniature broom holder. <laughs> okay? He had planed away so much of the thing. Well, Gary was in the process of learning how to do this. And I think Jesus did the same thing. You think Jesus walked into that synagogue one day and he used his godly abilities to wow the professors? No, he says it was his custom on the Sabbath to be in the synagogue learning God's word. They didn't have books in those days. They didn't have Kindle, okay? So the only way they got the scriptures is what? To go to synagogue. And so he went to synagogue, but he wasn't texting. He wasn't daydreaming. He wasn't poking his brothers and his sisters. He was listening and learning, and he was processing. See, so he had to grow <clears throat> just as in anything. Um, anyway, and so we need to grow. We need to follow Jesus' life, his character, his activities, and we're going to learn a lot about this in the upcoming messages. Let me give you some examples, some fundamentals about where we begin our growth. Okay? Just for today, especially for today in one sense. One of the things that Jesus did when it was time for him to begin his ministry was to do what? To be baptized. Okay? He stepped forward, and he says, I'm here to be baptized. And what does John the Baptist say? No way, Jose, or Jesu. Okay? What was his reply? It's proper for me to fulfill all righteousness. Meaning, no, my baptism isn't to show my repentance for sins. I never did this. But because the others have sinned, 
and they need to do this in their first step, then I'm going to set an example and I'm going to show them. And so what happens? He gets baptized. Um, when Peter, when he gives his commission to his apostles to go out and to evangelize, what is it really to do? He says to do what? To make disciples. He says be going, be teaching, be baptizing. So he commanded them to fulfill this function. So he was continuing to carry on this message. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached his sermon, and he talked about how they were to be saved, he told them, repent and what? Be baptized. When Cornelius, the centurion, the non-Jew, was saved, you know what happened to him? First, the Holy Spirit fell on him, and he was able to speak in various languages. And Peter says, see, here's proof that God has accepted them and made them just like us. Now, will anybody dare forbid me from baptizing them? And that's how they began to follow the example. He set the example Jesus did, and he says, hey, follow in my steps. The other thing we talked about a moment ago was learning God's word. This has become easier than ever, learning God's word. Some of you are in Sunday school. Some of you are in Bible study fellowship. Anybody subscribe to any podcast from religious teachers? Yeah, okay. That's another way. How many of you read blogs of pastors, theologians? That's another way, okay? I like Sunday school. You know why I like Sunday school? Because what happens in Sunday school is very different. It is an opportunity to learn together for collective understanding, not just from your own point of view. Because what usually happens is when we're just thinking on our own, we're just reinforcing our own point of view. But when we're learning in community, we're broadening our understanding. And the collective wisdom of the group becomes our personal wisdom. Even if we disagree, we can learn from it. And so, you know, it's something that we need to do. Two fundamentals. Baptism, learning God's word the way Jesus did. Um, you can't, as an adult, live off of a child's notion of God. Um, one day, the leaders at Apple decided we're going to get into the telephone business. We're going to invent, they didn't have a name for it yet, the iPhone. So the guy who was in charge of that division, he called all the top leaders and the most capable people in Apple. He says, we have a chance for you to do something that you will remember for all your life a chance to accomplish something that you'll always be so proud of. But you know, one of the things is you're going to have a lot of mistakes. You're going to commit many blunders along the way. And there's going to be a lot of disappointments when these things don't work out. And you know what he found? Most of the people turned out to be those with a fixed mindset. They were protecting their talents. They were protecting their position. They were protecting their status. There were a few who said, something that great? I don't care about the mistakes. We'll just learn from our mistakes. Like Thomas Edison, we'll find out what doesn't work and keep moving toward what does work. And those were the people that finally got selected to work on the iPhone project. The people with the growth mindset. And what happened? They got into the lab and they worked long hours and they suffered a lot and they made a lot of mistakes. 
But when the iPhone came out, bunches of you went on bottom. First generation, second generation, third generation. You know? Jesus wants us to have a great life. A quality, abundant life. He says, follow me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. But you know what? It's not that hard. If you like me, just be like me. Don't be an admirer. Be a follower. So, in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at many different ways where we can follow Jesus. Okay? And I hope that you're looking forward to growing just as I'm looking forward to us all growing together. Um, Anyway, so hope you'll be inviting people. Think about people in your neighborhood. Think about people in your family. And uh, let's grow together, all right? Let's grow as a congregation as well as individually. Okay.